you are one of thousands of people enjoying the content produced by Christ Community Church's C3 Media. First, we want to say thank you and let you know it's our pleasure to serve you. As a nonprofit organization, we are always looking for strategic and financial partners. If you are benefiting from our content, we ask that you consider partnering with us. Even a small donation like $1 per week would go a long way. Also, please make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thank you for your continued support, and we know God has a great plan for your life. So this morning, what is on my heart, and I just went with the title of a Christmas song because it is goes along with the question that I am posing for all of us, which is, what child is this? You know, we are celebrating, as Christians, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus. So we know who the child is. But there's so much going on this time of year. Has anybody else had a crazy holiday season? Oh, really? Yeah, a few, just a couple hands for those of you who are watching online. Yeah, it's just been really wild this year. Um, But I love singing songs. In fact, we had a blast Wednesday night for those that came out for our sing-along. We did it karaoke style and sang songs. And, you know, but I think about even some of the songs we sing. I'm like, really? What does that mean? You know, uh, do we even know what we're singing about? And one of the songs um, that came to mind was the 12 Days of Christmas. And I have to share this. I know some of you listen to Dutch Sheets, so some of you, especially our intercessors, heard this. But he was sharing this the other morning on Give Him 15, which I listen to most every morning. It's a little 15-minute or less devotional. But he shared about the 12 Days of Christmas. So, And I found it very interesting, so I'm sharing it with you. So, because we're singing all these things, a partridge in a pear tree and two turtle doves, and I've never even looked them up. I don't know what half the things are, but it's fun to sing. So, according to him, because he did the research, so I didn't have to, he said that this was a poem originally written by Catholic clerics. And when I looked it up, I saw that it was actually published as a song. I think it was in the late 1700s. So, this is really old. Um, And so as they wrote it, they wrote it because they needed to use codes to disguise their teachings in order to avoid persecution. So, yeah, we know there's persecution going on worldwide. We continue to pray for Israel and all that's going on there and those of the faith of Jewish, Palestinian, all those of the faith of Jesus. We're praying for them. But to realize, you know, there was persecution throughout the Dark Ages, all of those things. And so somebody wrote this um, and put it into the form of a poem, but things that they could use to disguise their teaching about Jesus. So we'll start with day one. What is day one? Okay, wow. Partridge in a pear tree. All right. Any guess what that might represent? Jesus, yeah. Jesus. All right. Day two. Two turtle doves. All right. That would represent the Old and New Testaments. Does that make sense? All right. Day three. You guys are good. (laughs) I'm better going 12 down trying to get it this way. Okay. Three French hens represented faith, hope, and love, and yes, the Trinity. So good, Jimmy. All right. So four days. Calling birds represent Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. Four Gospels. All right, and our big one, day five. (laughs) I know. I can't say it. I have to sing it. Yeah, so five golden rings represent the first five books of the Old Testament, which is called the Torah. Six, Gisa Lane. All right, they say each egg represents a day in creation when God hatched or formed the world. So that's what they used for that. Seven represent the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit as the Catholics counted them then. So seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Eight 
maids of milking. <laughs> close, close. <laughs> maids of milking represent the eight beatitudes. Nine. No. Ladies dancing. I know some of them are written differently, so that can get a little challenging. But ladies dancing represent the nine fruits of the spirit. Ten. Lords a leaping represent the ten commandments. Good job. All right. Eleven. Pipers piping represent the eleven faithful disciples, excluding Judas, who betrayed Jesus. And finally, the last twelve. Drummers drumming represent the 12 points of doctrine in the Apostles' Creed. So there's something, a new take as you sing 12 Days of Christmas again this year. can remember all of those things. You know, but there's a lot of things we do that we don't maybe know really the deeper meaning behind it. And so I want to take a look at, by looking at some of the Christmas narrative, who Jesus is, who they were told about, what he represents, but then to look at, because, you know, we sing all these songs about the baby in a manger, and we know he's no longer a baby, but he is Jesus, Lord of all, King of kings, and he lives within each one of us. That's where he is now. But we'll start with Mary and Joseph. I think that's a good place to start. And we'll read the passage in Matthew 1, 18 through 21. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So Joseph and Mary were both visited by angels on different occasions and told this story that she was going to conceive a son. And I just talk about a crazy time of your life. I see so much because we, we sing the songs about Silent Night, and we will be singing that during the candle lighting. And, and, oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. And we just think peace and, okay, everything was good, but... There was a lot going on, and I think for Mary and Joseph um, to know that they were going to have a son conceived by the Holy Spirit, <laughs> that's a little different. But I really want to highlight Joseph for a second and just say, you know, what a man of God. Yes, he was visited by an angel, so that would help reinforce what Mary was telling him. Like, Joseph, you know, this is from God. <laughs> I didn't step outside our bounds of marriage, you know. But it's a lot to handle. And the fact that he said, okay, I'm standing by you. We believe what God has told. Even though the accusations that would have come against them, I just think in the community, even from family. And this is a little beside the point, but I just felt led to share that part. Because I feel like there's a lot of us who deal with accusation and things that are being said you know, just by, you know, even our, our loved ones, those very, very close to us. And to know that Joseph and Mary knew what those things were like. But yes, you might say, well, they had angels visit them. Well, you know, yes, but after months of dealing with accusation and maybe shame and the different things they had to feel, I'm sure it would be like, well, was that an angel or did I just eat some bad pizza and have a really weird dream? You know, to be real. These are real people. But they knew what God had said. And they stuck to the plan of God, even though then they had to leave their family. I thought about that. Travel to Bethlehem. 
So they're getting ready to have a baby. They're young. They're probably 16 is what most people say. Um, that's when people got married then. And so they had to leave all their family, friends, travel to Bethlehem. Mary's nine months pregnant. It was not easy. And it probably felt very lonely. But God was with them. And so I just want to encourage anybody, anybody that's listening online and feel like, you know, I'm just tired of what everybody says about me or I feel shame and you're just battling these things. God's with you. God is with you. It's the same God that was with them that is with each one of us. And he says, you are valuable, you are loved, and he has a great plan for your life. So we're going to continue looking at the plan for this baby. So yes, for Joseph and Mary, they were having a son. But they were also then having a son they were naming Jesus, who would be the savior of the world. So then we go on to Luke, and we're only going to briefly look at the shepherds because we're going to come back to that as I was thinking more on that tonight at 11. Sounds like the news, but it's 11 p.m. candlelight service. So yeah, so you could come out for that. But we're going to look at what the shepherds saw because we're comparing what they see with their eyes versus then what they're told. Joseph and Mary saw with their eyes a baby, their son. They were told, you will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Luke 2, 15 through 16 after the angels had left the shepherds, said, when the angels had left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that had happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. So what did the shepherds see with their natural eyes? They saw a baby lying in swaddling claws, lying in a manger. That's what the shepherds saw. But then they knew, supernaturally, spiritually, that this was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's this Jesus. So then let's look at Luke 2, 29 and 32, because this is looking at some other people that then encountered baby Jesus about 40 days after his birth, because that was the purification time for Mary till she could go to the temple. And there were two people there, Simeon and Anna, who had been waiting for this promise. So I wanna look at what they saw when they looked at this child. So Luke 2, beginning in verse 29 says, Simeon cradled the baby in his arms and praised God and prophesied Lord and master, I am your loving servant, and now I can die content, for you have fulfilled your promise to me. With my own eyes, I have seen your word, the Savior you sent into the world. He will be glory for your people Israel and the revelation light for all people everywhere. You know, for Simeon, who was an older man, so this was not just waiting for this promise for 10 years or something. It says he was older, and so is Anna, who we're going to talk about next. But this baby would be in the natural an answer of a prophetic promise. And it said the Holy Spirit had spoken to him, that you will see this baby, the Lord, before you die. But then as he was speaking, and we would say prophesying out, What did he call Jesus? He said, this is the revelation light for all people everywhere. That means for each of us. He is our revelation light. And that is my prayer today, not only for this service, but each service, that God would reveal himself more and more to each one of us, that his light would flood our bodies, our hearts, and our minds as we're listening to some scriptures that we've probably all heard before. But we would have the revelation of who this child is. He's not just a little baby in a manger, but he's so much more. He is Savior. He is the Lamb of God. He is revelation light. Then we look at Anna, who they say was anywhere between 84 and over 100 years old. 
She's the next one we're going to look at in this story. And this is verses 29 through 32. It says, while Simeon was prophesying over Mary and Joseph and the baby, Anna walked up to them and burst forth with a great chorus of praise to God for their child. From that day forward, she told everyone in Jerusalem who was waiting for their redemption that the anticipated Messiah had come. So Anna, again, had this promise in her heart, said she was in the temple day and night worshiping God for the majority of her life because she was only married for a few years, and then she was a widow for the rest of her life, and she was in the temple every day just ministering unto God. And she was waiting. There was a promise in her heart that she would see Jesus, this baby, this child. But then what did she know in her spirit? That he was Messiah, which means the anointed one who would then set them free. The redemption of Jerusalem. Jesus, this child, this baby, was not just a promise fulfilled in her heart, but he is the Messiah, the anointed one, sent not just for Jerusalem, but now that promise is for all of us to set us free. And I just want to encourage you with that because once a word is spoken, it says every promise that God has given us will not return void. So these words that are spoken and when they say he came to set his people free, that's for each one of us. Those promises continue to ring out. Those words are continuing to be activated. And so if you're struggling with something in your life, maybe an addiction, which we're going to hear a little bit more about a testimony of that from Alan Scott. I'm going to share just one of the stories from his newsletter. But if you are here struggling with addiction, I want to tell you the same Jesus that we are reading about, that we are celebrating today, is continuing to set people free. So he will break off addiction. He will break off those things that weigh us down because Jesus is Messiah. He is the anointed one to set his people free. And so then we go on to one more group of people, one more story in Matthew 2. And we know this one. We've been actually using this passage with our 25 days of Christmas. And have you all, have any of you here seen any of those 25 days of Christmas? Have you been enjoying that? I know I have. And so if you haven't uh, had a chance to check that out, I would just encourage you. It's on our Facebook. It's on our YouTube. But this is the text we used talking about what gift can we give to the king? And so we look at the wise men here in Matthew 2, beginning in 9 through 11. It says, when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So in the natural, what did the wise men see? Actually, it was a young child. We say baby, and in the nativities, we always show the wise men right there with the shepherds. But actually, Jesus was a young child, probably around two or less. And we'll find that out shortly when we read the next part. But it said they went to where the young child was, and they presented the gifts. So they saw a young child, but then they also saw a king. Because the gifts they presented are gifts that are presented to a king. And they said, this is the king of the Jews. So these wise men, these scholars knew because they had been studying the stars that there would be this king that has been spoken about that would come. And so they went when the star appeared and followed that star, yes, to find this king who was a toddler 
at that moment. And so the revelation is that he is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. And he continues to be that for each one of us. And so finally, there's one more person in this, in that same narrative with the wise men. And I bring this up for a reason. So we're going to look at Matthew 2, verses 12 and 13. So this is continuing from the wise men right after they present their gifts. It said, then, being divinely warmed in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So yeah, Herod knew that there was going to be this young child, but what did he see? Supernaturally, spiritually, he knew there was something going on, that this was more than just a child or a baby, because he saw Jesus as a threat. I mean, what king, if this baby was truly just, just another child, just another baby, then why would a king send people to Bethlehem to kill every boy two years of age and younger? And this is what he did because Jesus was really to come as the king of the Jews because he is who we say he is. And so it's kind of like the case for Christ. <laughs> if you want to know where I'm going with all of this to realize we read these texts, but there's also things historically, Josephus, who I'm not going to go into, but he writes these things down, that these things happened it wasn't just something that, okay, there's in the Bible, but truly there was a King Herod who ordered sons, boys, two and younger, to be killed in the city of Bethlehem because he perceived this as a true threat. And so the question then comes to us as we're reading these things, and it's the same question that Jesus posed to his disciples in Matthew as they had been spending time with him. And he said, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And that's the question for each one of us this Christmas Eve is, who do we say Jesus is? Do we think he's just a baby that we sing about this time of year and, you know, we get to celebrate and give gifts and decorate and have fun? Or do we know that he is king, that he is Lord, that he is Messiah, that he came for a larger purpose? It said that Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies while he was here. Over, well over 300 prophecies that were written about him in the Old Testament before he even came to be. This is Jesus. And so I look at things that we see today. You know, we um, have gone to Christopher Alam's crusades. We've had him here several different times. He's an evangelist over in Africa, also goes to India, and he sees thousands and thousands and thousands of people come to his crusades. And there's testimonies of what Jesus is doing, not just over 2,000 years ago and the things I'm presenting, but today. In fact, he just came back from being in India, and he writes about the lame being healed and walk, the blind now see, the deaf hear. In fact, I was at one of his crusades probably over 15 years ago now, and I actually saw these things happen. I saw people come forward who couldn't hear, and then they could hear. I got to be a part of praying for them. This is real. This is Jesus. He's not just a baby. <laughs> he is real. He is our healer. Then we have stories, but before I share this story, because I'm going to ask, and I ask him, Matt, if you would just jump up here real quick, because I want you to hear what's going on here, and then I'm going to share another testimony that Alan shared in his newsletter, because Jesus is moving today. So, Matt. Yes. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> So, I want to testify to what Jesus has done in my life recently, amen? Awesome. So, 
uh, I was I was sitting in the front row. Pastor Dean was also sitting in the front row, and and I've I was dealing with some pain in my knee. I've been going to the gym a lot and working out, maybe not stretching as much as I should, um, but uh, maybe I'm just putting a lot of weight on. I'm just really strong. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'm sitting on the front row, and and I've been really dealing with a knee issue, and I've been. I was rubbing it, and she she noticed, and I and I said to myself, Pastor Dean is going to call me out a little later, I'm sure. But this pride was welling up on the inside of me, and I was saying, you know, I, I'm good. Jesus, gee, he'll take care of it at some point. But she was like, what is wrong with your knee? And I said, I'm, I'm good, but she was like, well, let's pray for it. I said, you know what, you're right. Obviously, let's pray for it, right? Healing is the children's bread. And so Pastor Dina, it really didn't take long. She prayed over me, uh, you know, maybe 30 seconds, and she put her hand on my knee, and I was like, oh, my. <laughs> it, and the pain completely went away. And not only did it, amen, yeah, thank you, Jesus, that's right. But not only did the pain on the front of my knee go away, but there was pain on the back of my knee that I don't even think I told Pastor Dean about. That went away as well. And so he did even more than I could even ever ask or think. Amen. Jesus is real and he is moving and he is doing incredible things. And I've got more testimonies that you'll hear later on at the other services. But I just want to share with you when you think about who this child is to you, who is Jesus to you, that he is real and he is healing. He's restoring families. Alan Scott one of the places they went was Altoona, PA. So I wanted to share something that was in our own backyard, as we know, Altoona. And he went there. This was the end of October. It said October 28th of this year. It said over 600 people registered to attend. During the altar call, a third of those in attendance stood to receive Jesus. A third. Yeah. And that's not talking about all the ones that then came forward to lay down their drugs and the things that they were addicted to. And Christian can tell you a whole lot more. I know he got to pray for people. He travels with them. So this is real life. This is what Jesus is doing now. And so my hope is that as we're sharing some of these testimonies, that this will encourage you to consider that question again today of who Jesus is. Who is this child we're celebrating? What does he want to do in your life? And if the worship team could come up, we're going to close with a prayer that I want to give you the opportunity. What better day than Christmas Eve? <laughs> we are celebrating the birth of Jesus God's greatest gift that he gave to each one of us, that he sent his son to come in flesh for us so that we might be able to live forever with him and become sons and daughters of Christ. I want to share just the final scripture in John 14, 6 in the Amplified, because this is who Jesus says he is. I am the only way to God and the real truth, and the real life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that's what Jesus says about himself. And so I want to give you that invitation today, those watching online. If you haven't made that commitment to say, Jesus, I recognize you, not just as somebody I sing about this time of year in our Christmas carols, but I recognize you as Jesus, as Lord, as Redeemer, Messiah, Lamb of God, Revelation Light, all these things that we've read about, all names of Jesus, but it's who he is. And so we're going to take a moment now and just ask you to bow your heads with me. And if you want to make this commitment today to say, Jesus, I recognize you as Lord and Savior. Jesus, 
I recognize that you are the only way to God, then pray that with me and say, Jesus, (laughs) I recognize that I'm a sinner, that I've fallen short, that I've made mistakes. But I thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice on the cross, that you died for me to cleanse me, to make me new. I declare today that you are my Lord. And I thank you for that gift of eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. And then I just want to take a moment and pray for those that may be struggling this Christmas season. If you want to stand with me, because we're, we're closing out. And we will have a prayer team up here, and I'm hoping Matt can be a part of that, because I would love for Matt, if you have a healing need, a physical healing need in your body, I would encourage you to go to him, because when somebody shares that testimony of what God has done, that's because God's going to do it again. That's a testimony. That's what he does. He does it again. And so I would encourage you to take a moment. If you have any physical needs, come up, get prayer before you leave. You'll feel better. (laughs) But Lord, we just thank you for today. Father, we thank you that we declare here together that you are Lord, that you are the only way to God. And we thank you, Father God, that you provided a way for us to be reconciled to you. So Lord, I pray over all those that are here, those that are listening online. Father, we pray that you would bring them health. Father, that you would lift them up. Father, for those that are struggling. Father, maybe even dealing with depression and anxiety. It can be hard for some this time of year. And Father, I even just speak now to those that are dealing with suicidal thoughts. And Lord, we break that off of their lives in Jesus' name. And Father, right now I pray they would hear your voice clearly saying, you are my son, you are my daughter, and I have a good plan for your life. I have hope for you. I have joy for you. I have so much more for you in this coming year. So I pray that you would be filled with his joy of overflowing hope that he has for each one of us. I pray that if you're struggling with addiction, that today would be the day that you would be set free. And Lord, we just thank you, Father. We rejoice with you this season. Father, of all the good things that you have for each one of us, that we can truly sing your praise. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill to all mankind. So Father, we thank you for all this. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.